got here, you have to see the city. There was a change that was so tremendous, you wouldn't believe it. Immokalee Road, after you got past 951, was two lanes. Two lane highway, that was all it was. If you know the road out there, there was no quarry. And suddenly, that whole area was building up. If people could remember 20 years ago, if we, we had a picture of that road, they, they would be absolutely amazed. And it, it just kept on growing and growing and growing. unto the Lord for he is good Alleluia. the church was out in the middle of nowhere and you drove out there didn't have a key to look inside this building it was a little white church white well I call it church but it was a little white house and uh, we look in the windows and my wife looked at me and she says we left a church that seats 500 people to come down here for this? Well, this is what we signed up for. We'll see what's going to happen. They bought about 10 pews, uh, 10 pews that would hold about six people each. Uh, so we could hold about 60 people in there. And uh, of course, after the first couple months, uh, we started getting a fairly decent crowd of the people that had originally signed up for the church. But uh, it, got, it, got, it got big from Bonita Springs and from the area uh, north there. And uh, uh, we just kept on growing and growing. And, uh, now we were positive that we could succeed in the church uh, and we could succeed in building a church here. The bishop, uh, Antun, he was the bishop for this area. He came and visited and he sat down with a couple of guys and they said, uh, are you gonna just do anything? Our little white house was fine. In fact, a lot of people <laughs> like the idea of, the, of staying in the Little White House. Some people actually cried when we left the Little White House. But in the long run, uh, there was an ongoing progress of uh, building a church. Some of the most important people who made things happen were the founders. In thy kingdom, remember us, O Lord, when thou comest in thy kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, 
merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. What we did is, as a tradition of the church was that the ashes from uh, the incense, we would save them. The ashes from vestments that were burned were saved. And all of this went into a container. And then one Sunday, the entire parish came and we gave them a spoon. And each one would take and dip the spoon in the ashes and mark the outline of the whole boundary of the church. And that became the outline. And that was also part of the breaking of the ground. We broke the ground and we spread the ashes and we started the, the building of the church. When we built the dome, the dome was built independent and it was transported out to the church. And when it was transported out to the church, we blessed it while it was on the ground and we had a crane. And I think we had about maybe 50 or more people who came out and witnessed the crane lifting the crown, the cross and the, the dome, lifting it and placing it on top and completing the building. So the building was completely enclosed. That's before they put the drywall and everything else on the inside of the building. When we left the old church, we were inside the church, we have Vesper service. And at that Vesper service, the bishop was there and every person in the church was given an article and we carried them from the old church into the new church. We went in there and put everything in the, the church and we had an altar set up. And uh, the next day we had the first liturgy of the church. Then at the time when the bishop was available and everything was available, we, uh, we had uh, the, the consecration. principles of our holy orthodox faith the gates of repentance oh giver of life 
So my third year of seminary, I started hearing whispers that there might be an opportunity uh, for placement in Naples, Florida, just that it's going to become available. The ones telling me this mentioned it was a coveted parish that the priest would love to go there. Naples is beautiful, and the parishioners are lovely, they love the church, they love the community, and they work hard, and all these wonderful things. But I'm thinking, okay, good. It's coveted, everyone loves, uh, everyone loves each other down there, and people want to be there. The priests want to get transferred there. There's no way they're going to send me to Naples, Florida. I'm just a new guy, so check that off the, off the list. There's no way I'm coming down here. Why would they send me? But then they sent me. And it wasn't uh, exactly what we expected. But here, sitting now, planning the anniversary celebration of 25 years and seeing where the parish has moved from over five years ago, since we've been here over five years ago, um, how can you do anything or think anything other than, wow, this is what the Lord has willed. It's hard to know what to think when you're assigned as the Proistominos, the head priest at a parish right out of seminary, especially following, you know, Father Joseph Shaheen, uh, who is a veteran in the archdiocese and has been a priest for over 60 years, serving and, you know, leading. So for me, this, this pipsqueak to show up and to lead some souls and to, to help continue the things that he has laid the foundations uh, of. Um, it's a big thing. Every priest is called to learn the ways of the Lord and how to reconcile people back to God. How to reconcile people back to God and to actually do it. And all I could think about was, how can I reconcile myself back to God? The starting point has to be us, has to be ourselves. And so in speaking with my spiritual father, he reminded me, I just have to love the people, to learn how to sacrifice like Christ sacrificed. The rest will be in the hands of the Lord. And like my spiritual father reminds me, the people suffer when the prayers of their spiritual father suffers. So if the spiritual father is not praying, if he's not hunting for Christ in the darkness of the night, then, uh, uh, then the people will begin to drown. And so I think about these things often. I think about these things often, and this is the heavy responsibility. And I fail at it all the time, but the Lord is merciful, quick to embrace us. People ask what my vision is. I have no idea what my vision was up until maybe a year or so ago. It takes time to understand. But what is my vision? It's exactly what this parish is becoming, which is a beacon of light in Southwest Florida. Honestly, people are moving here from all over, even the country. They want to be a part of the parish, a part of the community. And that means something. And that's all from the seed planted by the founders, right? Establishing what we have here through the leadership of Father Joe and Khuri Diane, um, through the, the courage and commitment of Father Elia, in the hard work of Father Basil, after Father Nia. This is uh, no small thing. And to see the parish now becoming this beacon of light, uh, people joining and, and becoming Orthodox Christians. And also, it makes me so happy to see the pan-Orthodoxy of the parish, that this isn't for Syrians and Lebanese only. This isn't for Greeks only. It's not for Albanians or Romanians and Russians and Ukrainians and Serbs and so forth. It's for everybody. And everybody can feel that that comes here. And I feel like it's so beautiful that people can come here and feel welcome and embraced and loved and cared for. Coming to this, this beautiful church, this community that was planted 25 years ago, really from nothing, having known each other, the people for quite some time, even growing up together, uh, they formed such a beautiful bond and a love for Christ and Orthodoxy and this Holy Archdiocese, really the Patriarch of Antioch, of course. And to think about where they would worship this place or that place, this room or that room, and just pieced it all together until they providentially came upon this property. 
and uh, made the necessary sacrifices to acquire it. And then they worshiped in the house that they converted into a church. And then they built this temple. 25 years of that leading to this, it just makes me think about the providence of God and His hand in all of this. I sit in this temple often by myself when I think to God, say to the Lord, when did all of this happen? How did all of this happen? Oh, Father, you did this and this happened and this came and that's there and this and that. How and how? I don't know how. I don't know how and the church grew and this and they want to know. I don't know. It's a miracle, I tell them. It's a miracle. There's no, there's no plan for this. Only God's plan. It's only our faithfulness as a community that can participate in the divine energy of God and can bless a community. Pretty incredible. Ah. Uh -huh.